Um, so I've got two talks. One I'm going to go through in about 10 minutes because Gabe already gave it this morning, but it's the end of the day. It's been a great day, long day. I've enjoyed everything I've listened to, even if it's ammunition to be able to shoot somebody with. And, <laughs> and I've enjoyed everything I've heard today. And so maybe at this point, it's good to just, just slip through some real fast, um, what I call big picture principles, all right? And then what I want to really spend my time on is I want to, I want to share what I call the 10 threads of, of success for what I see around the world for, uh, for startup farms. The 10 threads of success for that. Because my sense, I had several other ideas here, but as I've talked to people today, I think there are a lot of newbies, wannabes, you know, ready to go here, people that's got, that have small acreages or just ready to start. And so I, I think that would be kind of new information. We, we're, we're, you know, we're about full up to here on soil. Not that, you know, soil is not a boring subject, but, you know, finally at the end of the day, you, you just can only talk about, only digest so much, you know, uh, worm material. So, 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 so here are 10 big picture things to kind of cap the day that I think, I call them principles of function, all right? People look at me and they say, you know, how'd you get so creative? I say, look, I'm not that creative. Uh, I just step back and look and say, and say how, does, how does this work? How does, how does the world work? How, do, how does the ecosystem work? And when you look at it, you see, number one, guess what? Animals move. I mean, you know, we live in a culture right now that doesn't think animals move. I mean, the chickens are supposed to be locked up in houses. The pigs are supposed to be, you know, 5,000 in a house. I mean, uh, it, it's unbelievable. Um, the reason for animals in nature is that they are the only way nature has of, there are several reasons, but one is they move nutrients that gravitationally move downhill. They eat in, in the valleys and then they walk it in their, dige, in their GI tract, in their rumen, in their, okay, and, and they walk it. Imagine this being a valley and a hill. They walk up to the hill and sit here, chew on it all day. When they stand up, they poop. They stretch, they pee over here, okay? And they're moving the nutrients, the minerals and the biomass and all this stuff, or the organic matter that would, that would gravitationally slough and move downhill. They move it back uphill, and we can be thankful for predators that make them want to come up to the hill so they can look around and see who's out there to get me. And that instinctual predator-prey relationship helps ensure this fantastic nutrient cycle. So, it is, so, so one of the reasons for animals is for fertility democratization. Okay? And that is why, dear folks, there is no animalless ecosystem. You ever think about that? And yet we have, we have lots of of agriculture land in the U.S. trying to grow things in an animal-less system. Drive through Iowa and Illinois today and all the fences that Grandpa had in the 30s and 40s in a multi-dimensional, multi-speciated, diversified, animal-incorporated system, the fences are gone. And you can drive for miles and there, there's not a fence. We, we see it in our own community, and we're not, you know, we're not nearly as, whatever, you know, industrial ag as other places. So, um, there is no animalist ecosystem, and they are there to move fertility. That's one capstone. Number two, soil is fundamentally carbon-centric. And I'm going through these really fast because, like Gabe said it all this morning, I'm just reiterating it in our memory. It kind of helped to, to nail it down for the end of the day. Soil is fundamentally carbon-centric. It is not 10-10-10-centric, okay? It is not anhydrous ammonia-centric. 
Soil is fundamentally carbon-centric. So if we want to build soil, it becomes primarily an issue of carbon management. How do we get more of it? How do we keep more of it? How do we, how do we put it in the right form? It, it, ha, it's all about carbon management, carbon centricity. Number three, um, landscape disturbance. Landscapes are not static. They are dynamic. I find it fascinating that we currently have uh, you know, uh, uh, radical environmentalist organizations trying to um, tie up uh, uh, tree parks in Maryland that 500 years ago were, uh, got the fertility they got because beavers dammed up a creek and made a great big uh, lake there from a, from a beaver dam, and now we're going to freeze these trees, you know. Uh, um, landscapes are dynamic. They're, 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 either, they're either succeeding, they're, they're regenerating, or they're degenerating, or they're moving. They're, they're, they're something. And, and, you know, you think about uh, Captain Jim Bridger, you know, the first time he went out through the Black Hills of the Dakotas, and he, and, um, he, encountered, a, he encountered a herd of six million bison. Now, this has always been kind of funny to me. Can you see? I mean, Captain Jim Bridger, he's sitting on his horse, right, you know. He's looking out across there. <laughs> Lieutenant, Lieutenant, no, come up here. Come up here. Uh, sharpen your quill. Sharpen your quill here. Pull out a piece of paper uh, and start putting down uh, tick marks. One, two, <laughs> got that two, three, got three, four, uh, uh, five. Put a cross hatch. Six, yeah, six million bison. <laughs> now, I don't have a clue how he counted them, but that's what he said in his official, you know, U.S. Cavalry report. Six million bison. In fact, he got behind one of these herds. He said, we would have all started death because it took us five days to get out from behind them and find a morsel for our horses to eat. If we hadn't have been carrying oats for the horses, we'd have all perished because it took us five days to get out from behind this destructive swath from this herd of six, six million bison. I mean, they made wallers. Remember Little House on the Prairie? They made wallers. They'd get in there with their horns and they'd dig these, these, these ponds, right? Uh, dust baths that were the size of a house. I mean, you could fall into that thing. Big time. Your car could fall into that thing. Even your SUV would be swallowed up in these things. The landscape is in a perpetual place of movement. Number four, integration. Integration. When you look at nature, what you see is integration. You don't see segregation. You see integration between animals and plants. You see Proximate cycling, you know, in nature there is no waste. Everything that wastes becomes the fuel or the feedstock for the next, you know, biota, all right? It's, there is no away in nature. It is a zero waste system. It's fundamentally integrated. It's, it's multi-speciated. You don't see single species, you see multi-speciated. Um, look at the forest open riparian edge effect. Anybody that studies wildlife knows that the, the, the greatest diversity of plant and animal life in the most balanced place, the most productive place on your place is where open land, forest land, and riparian areas intersect, those three great environments, okay? So if we can, if we can create more edge effect and if we can diversify that and we can integrate, I mean, fundamentally, um, you know, we're looking at, at, at tightly, uh, symbiotic, synergistic systems. And, and remember, you know, Gabe's talk. I mean, it's a perfect example of that. Number five, nature is fundamentally local-centric. It's local-centric in information. It's local-centric seasonal. It's, it, it, it's fundamentally um, proximate. For example, um, right now, what we have are people getting uh, um, uh, environmental stewardship awards in, in like colleges, right? Uh, because they started a food services composting program where the, the food comes out of dining services and it, and it goes into these barrels. They go on a diesel truck. The diesel truck takes them out, you know, 10 miles away to a composting site, compost it, and then we get to bring the compost back and put it around the azaleas and the rose bushes and it's all, you know, this wonderful thing. And, oh, we get these nice creamy plaques. You know, you 
become an environmental stewardship recipient by, you know, whatever the environmental organization is. True environmentalism would actually localize all that and create a fundamentally integrated, tied-up cycle where we'd put a, uh, a chicken house next to the dining services back door and the kitchen scraps come out into the chicken house and the chickens eat the kitchen scraps, lay eggs, the eggs go into the dining services and this just goes back and forth and back and forth and now we don't even have to buy eggs from a factory and we don't have to send the scraps anywhere on a diesel truck anywhere. See, that's a fundamentally localized system and that's the way nature works. Nature doesn't truck stuff too far actually. It, 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 it doesn't send it very far, okay? So, so we're looking for these kinds of systems. And if I may say, if I may go where angels fear to travel, we, we hear about the food deserts, you know, a big urban, urban issue. And in fact, you know, it's a rural issue. You know, our county has several food deserts because people are too far away from a Coke machine. So that's how you define a food desert. And so, so you got this food. The answer to food deserts is not more food banks. The answer to food deserts is often they're in a rundown sort of place in town where there's a lot of vacant lots and crumble down buildings. If you could go over to one of those lots and grow some vegetables in there, some, you know, uh, um, single mom of four, you know, in poverty there in the tenements goes over there. She's got a little entrepreneurial, you know, green thumb bent. All right. So she goes over there and she plants this garden and she, uh, and she has some chickens and rabbits, right? And she brings that stuff in. She makes pot pies and quiche and, 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 uh, you know, heavy stews in her kitchen and sells it to the people around in the tenement. That's the, that's the answer to food deserts. But what if she did that? Why, if she did that, within 10 minutes, five bureaucrats would be knocking on her door saying, where's your HACCP plan? Where's your building permit? Where's your OSHA approved, you know, wheelchair access? I don't think you got enough lumens in that light bulb. This is a residential area, not a business, you know, Right? You know, so, so when big organizations talk about we need to punch through government regulations, they're simply talking about, about moving around the farm subsidy pie. They're not talking about actually unleashing an entrepreneurial wave tsunami on our food system. If we would actually unleash food freedom to where anybody in this country could buy food from the source of their choice from, and have freedom of food choice, we would absolutely run corporate food out of business. We would. Number six, when you look at nature, you see that it is human-centric. Really? Yeah. Have you read 1491, 1493, Fire in America? An ecological Indian, I mean, I could go on with titles, right? But we now know, guns, germs, and steel, I mean, we now know, studying well, we, anthropologically, we now know that things as seemingly unmolested as the Amazonian rainforest was actually a planted tree garden with civilizations that were more advanced and intimidated the Spaniards, the only problem was they didn't have germs, they didn't have guns and gunpowder, okay? But as far as socially and productively, I mean, that's where biochar came from. That's advanced. I mean, we're just now trying to wrap our heads around what's biochar and trying to, you know, that's the darling of the new, you know, integrity food. I've got to get this biochar thing going, you know. And, and, but I mean, they did it back in 700 Okay, so what we now know is that every place on the face of, face of the earth has been touched by the hand of man. I hate to tell you. Now, unfortunately, in many, many, many places, we could argue most places, that hand has been the hand of a rapist. I get it. I understand. Okay, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we now have the technology, the know-how, and the understanding to be able to leverage our big brain and opposing thumbs in a caress and a remediation capacity, a redemptive capacity on this thing that we've raped. That's what we can do, and that's what we should be doing. And so to, to, uh, uh, you know, to go to a food and farming system that 
as that has a lot of human participation. In fact, this carries on to customers. Uh, you know, what, what we need is participants in the food system. And, uh, and so we need, uh, we need a, a, a revival of domestic culinary arts. You know, we live in a time when the average American spends less than 15 minutes in the kitchen, when we are far more knowledgeable and interested in the latest uh, dysfunction in the Kardashian family, if you can call that a family, <laughs> than we are what's going to become flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones at 6 o'clock. And folks, a society that's that disconnected and disinterested and ignorant about our connection to our ecological womb will be an incredibly dysfunctional society and do all of the backlash that a lack of this kind of interest gives us from the food system. Why do we have Campylobacter, Listeria, E. coli, you know, mad cow, all these things that we've learned to say in my lifetime? I mean, I grew up, anybody over 50, I guarantee you, you never heard the phrase food allergy. Never heard it. You know, if the church had a potluck, if the church had a potluck, nobody had to, you know, you didn't have to go there and go, well, I don't know if that's got gluten in it. Ooh, I don't know, you know. I mean, what, ha what happens is, when you so profoundly remove yourself from the visceral participatory responsibility of something as foundational as food, it gets taken over by enemies. And I say enemies on purpose. The people who run those big corporations, they don't care about your health. They really don't. All they care about is stockholder wealth or whatever. They're not at all interested. It's like Wendell Berry says, what's wrong with this creates more GDP than what's right with this. I mean, in our country, we actually, when we build hospitals and a lot more people have to go to, 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 to cancer doctors, we write that down as gross domestic product. We've had a good day today. You know, I'm, I'm ready for a new, uh, a new standard at the top of the newspaper. You know, they got the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I'm ready for the, uh, for, for the local uh, ecology uh, average right over here, you know. Uh, uh, five acres got paved over today, you know, the line goes down, you know. Uh, two million earthworms got, you know, destroyed by atrazine, you know, the line goes down. I mean, you know, but, but we don't even think about that. The fact is that, we, you know, Gabe was talking about our soil food web, and, and we've heard about that uh, throughout the day, and, and, and the fact is that every single one of us is completely and utterly dependent on this incredible, invisible universe under our feet. But the mycorrhizae never make it on a business plan. I mean, can you imagine going to the banker and saying, I got a business idea for you, you know, I need some money. And the banker sits back and he says, all right, let's hear it, you know. And, uh, you know, boss hog banker, right? And so, uh, so you present your plan. He says, he leans back in his big old leather bank chair. He says, well, he said, that's a, that's a real plan. He said, uh, we're going to be millionaires. In fact, I want to be your partner. But I got one question before I sign off on this million dollar loan. What's this business going to do to the mycelium in our community. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Good. I'm glad somebody said you could imagine. But think of how different our culture would be if we did it. All right. Uh, number seven, very quickly. Man, I'm going to run out of time. Okay. Uh, functional. What have I got? 530? Five. When? What is it? Uh, Number seven, number seven. I, I just get wrapped up in the stories and it's so fun. Funk, we, we've heard this today. Um, functional genetics. When you look at nature, what you see is functional genetics. You don't see, you don't see elk being chosen by their color or by how many points they have on their antlers or do their ears, you know, go right or left or wobble to and fro or whatever, you know. You don't see that in nature. I like what Elliot Coleman, guru of, of multi-season uh, farming says. He says, do you know that every morning the gazelle gets up and he stretches and all he thinks about all day is hoping that he could run one step faster than the lion. And every day the lion gets up, you know, big cat, right? I like cats. I'm a cat guy, not a dog guy. All right. 
The lion gets up and he's thinking, I hope today I can run one step faster than the gazelle. That's the way nature runs. And so that's why in a herd of 5,000 zebras on the Serengeti, you won't see 20 pounds difference between those, between those uh, uh, zebras. If they're bigger than that, they're too big a boiler. And as soon as the drought comes or difficulty comes, you know, they're, they're, they're dead. They can't make it. Too big a boiler. If they're 20 pounds too small, they can't kick the predators, okay? And they get eaten up by predators, all right? So, so nature has a way of moving everything to functionality. So here we are on our farms. We're wanting to go to functional real-time genetics. Line breeding. We're picking animals that actually work for us. You heard Gabe, some of you, I, 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 I heard some of the gasps when he said, those cows are out there in four years. And if they don't, they just, they just die, you know? And guess what? You don't have to worry about that cow next year. <laughs> you know what? That creates an adapted functional genetic for that area, okay? It sounds harsh, but ultimately, it's the way to wean yourself off of the pharmaceutical feed cake crutches. Who was it? Was it you, Gabe, that used the word, we're not, we're not running a bed and breakfast for cows here? That's a great, I gotta, you know, you, you, you gotta say things a couple times, to, I, that, that's a good one, I gotta remember that one. We're not running a bed and breakfast. And we live, in a, we live in a time where people are so disconnected, the only animal they ever see is their dog or cat, right? And, 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 and they have this idea that every single animal in the universe is supposed to live in a heated, air-conditioned atrium with a monogrammed L.L. Bean bean bag chair. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we spent three days with animal control twice dealing with 911 phone calls, people driving by of our, our, one of our farms that we rent, seeing a herd of 300 cows out there in a mob ready to move it for. We try to move about four o'clock every day. They're all standing there at the gate, you know, just quietly, passively chewing their cut, you know, but they're all right there at the gate ready to go through because they, I mean, they're on a routine. I mean, look, if every day at four o'clock somebody called you to a bowl of ice cream, you'd start to, you know, kind of come to where the... Where it was at four o'clock every day, right? So the cows, you know, they're routine. They, they, they know what's coming. And they, she calls 911, you know. There's this herd of cows there and they're, they're, in, a, they're in a real tight group like a crowd and, and crowds stress me and, and, and they just look stressed to me. Well, you know, the poor government, you know, uh, animal control officer, he can't say, lady, that's why they call him a herd. Shut up. <laughs> no, he's got it dutifully. You know, pull out the form, you know, and start in. And then the next thing we do, we're in three days of negotiations and all this stuff trying to punch through this animal abuse charge because people can see what we do. And we don't lock it up behind no trespassing signs and make people walk through sheep that put on a hazmat suit to come and visit their food. And if you got to do that, you might not want to eat your food. But functional genetics, you know, uh, um, this, this is a wildlife genetic breeding uh, uh, status. And, and when we have cows, for example, that don't fit our box and they're, and, and they're skinny or they're poor or they're whatever, you know, the fact is when you start letting kind of a, 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 a wildlife uh, genetic base function, you're going to have some junk. And, and because we have them in electric fence in there with the mob, you know, the wolves don't take them because they're protected. They'd be taken by the wolves, you know, out in, out in nature. But, but we have them and, and, and we're not going to prop them up with pharmaceuticals. They either make it or they die. If we keep everything with a bunch of pharmaceutical crutches, like animal welfare approved demands... That's why we're not certified by animal welfare approved. They want you, to, they want you to, to heroically save every single animal out there. And if you don't, it's abusive. It's nuts. Because how are we going to find out functional genetics unless we kick some crutches out and let stand who stands? You're never going to find out. And one of the reasons that we've so uh, uh, um, um, decreased the genetic viability and vibrancy of our national domestic stock, whether it's pigs, chickens, or turkeys, or cows, or whatever, 
They're much more fragile today than they were 50 years ago. The reason is because we've doped them up on a bunch of sweet cake and, 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 and pharmaceuticals, and so we've artificially propped up a bunch of poor animals. And so functional genetics is part and parcel. Number eight, a self-regulating balance. You know, nature goes to self-regulating balance. When, when, when things get out of whack, you have disease. I mean, right now in our area, one in two red foxes has the mange. And about one in four is rabid. Why? Well, because the animal rightists took away the live fur trade. So now people that used to grow up in our area averaging $50 a pelt, now it's not worth anything. So nobody traps anymore, as if they would, you know, pull them away from their games. But 50, you know, 100 bucks a pelt, they'd probably trap. So nobody traps, so now we have an overabundance of foxes because, you know, they're all pretty little pets, you know. And, and, and now they've all got the mange and rabies. Nature tends toward balance. I mean, there's a reason why the average NFL player is dead at 57. I mean, when your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak of nature. Nature weeks you out. <laughs> Here's the deal. Nature's default position is wellness. See, we live in a time where agribusiness and industrial agriculture and our, you know, great PhDs and all that, you know, they, most of them, they assume that nature's default position is sickness. Like, nature's fundamentally broken and we got to fix it. No, nature goes, it, it, it self-balances, it, it, it self-regulates. And so if there's something wrong, then, you know, we assume that it's, it's my fault. Number nine, Nature is perennially based, not annually based. Now, there are annuals in nature. Of course, there are annuals in nature, but they tend to be very short duration kind of things until the perennials can come back and get reestablished. You know, it might be a, a sediment load after a flood. It might be something after a volcano. It, it might be some, you know, great big disturbance thing. But generally, nature moves towards perennials and away from annuals. And when you think about our U.S. ag policy, uh, our crop insurance or whatever, you know, you have to realize that the six commodities that it ensures that we absolutely have to make a profit on and keep planting, those six commodities are annuals, not perennials. And so our entire civilization's agricultural theme assaults one of the most basic principles of nature. That's why we don't need a farm bill. We just need to eliminate the U.S. duh. Number 10, I've never seen a government agency as successful in annihilating its constituency as the U.S. does. Number 10, I think they ought to be, you know, I think they ought to be paid at the USDA for the number of farmers. You know, if we tied the number of employees at the USDA to the number of farmers, you know, that might be a good, you know, might be a good thing. All right, uh, number 10, um, nature grows from the inside out. Nature doesn't depend on a lot of outside stuff brought in. It stacks functions, and it actually, it actually um, um, produces from the inside out rather than the outside in. 